A double dip of the NBA playoffs last night as we saw the Boston Celtics eliminate the Miami Heat. That game was over very quickly. We will discuss a little bit uh, further of what's on tap for Boston moving forward because there's big questions. But I think the one that was a bit of a stunner, a 2-2 series between the Mavericks and Clippers in Dallas just blew the doors off of the Los Angeles Clippers last night. They did. And, well, it was fairly pretty close up until four and a half minutes or so in the second quarter. And then that's when, well, look, that's, hey, yeah. it was a one-point game a at that point. a quarter and two-thirds yeah, exactly. and then rolled it in. And then, yeah, I think uh, Dallas finished the first half on a 13-4 to four run and then got things up to 25 before the Clippers hit, like, three shots at the end of the third quarter. <laughs> I am shocked at how badly <laughs> some of these teams are shooting in the NBA playoffs. Last night was a perfect example. Well, it kind of fe- it's very weird because we get this feeling of almost like NCAA tournament when you get to a new venue and you see that shooting variance on the first day that that they're in there, and yeah. you're like, "What the hell happened to this team? I thought they could shoot." Nope, can't do it. Home teams are cooking; they're shooting really well. Now, that's kind of the most surprising thing about what the Clippers did last night is the Los Angeles Clippers became the first team in NBA history, regular or postseason, this is according to OptiStats, to have three nine-time All-Stars or better playing a, the, a single game, and they make all make less than a third of their field goals. Paul George was 4 of 13. James Harden was 2 of 12. Russell Westbrook was 2 of 11. That's probably the most Clipper stat you could ever find. Yes. Yeah. But the Clippers also, they they had like that run when they had like Blake Griffin and Chris Paul on the team where you're like, how are they, sh- how could they possibly be playing this poorly right now? Right. And they just entered a new wave of guys, different, different names, same result yeah. because of the Clippers. Well, and that's, we were talking about this before the show is that with their big four, you know, Kawhi and Paul George and Harden and and Westbrook, uh, you don't feel like you have a true leader among them. Mm-mm. They all just kind of seem aloof and and that they're not necessarily... Di- it's like they're not terribly interested in basketball. They're just good at it. Yeah, and I mean, I think that when you, when you hear James Harden and you see him, whether it's pouting on the sidelines during games or getting fat to get traded, like we get that feeling. Inherently, you have to have a drive and a passion to play the game of basketball to be as good as they are and to reach the levels that they do, right? Mm -hmm. But you're right when you watch a game, you're like, something is just missing here. And even like Russell Westbrook, it almost seems as if he has taken a step back from that Aggress- aggression and kind of what seems to look like passion during games, right? right. That would that would lead you to that. Yeah. What they have is a a leadership void. Yes. And leadership is of the utmost importance, especially when you get into the the playoffs. And it just seems like they don't have that alpha who wants to take over, and yeah. and, and be that voice. You can see it even in Boston, where that was kind of the conversation with the Boston Celtics with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum when they have the Jays where you're sitting there and you're going, all right, well, yeah, who's the leader of the team? Because it's not Al Horford. It kind of seems like the biggest name to kind of change that now has been Drew Holiday. And Drew Holiday kind of being that calming force when things are going wrong, Mm -hmm. but also the guy who can pull you out of of funks that are, are when things go sideways and when things go good, you know, keep tides rising for them. Well, and so, and that's, who on the Clippers is going to be able to pull the Drew, the Drew Holiday role? It's not going to be Zubats. I don't... I you, mean, are you looking at P.J. Tucker? I mean, he came in for the first time in the series last no, night. No. And that that's always been it. And I think if you look at the common thread, right, Kawhi Leonard has been on teams that have reached the mountaintop. Mm-hmm. But he was not that, that voice. Right. Whether it is in San Antonio or in Toronto, he was not that voice. Paul George is not that over-the-top leader guys will follow me he's a incredibly skilled player Mm -hmm. james harden has never been that will never be that no that's just not who he is and there's certain people where and, and you look at it and you say if you pair these guys up they are so talented that if that that voice is there then maybe you do get over the hump but if you look at james harden whether it was in houston 
the failed experiment in Brooklyn where you also had a very similar situation that they have in L.A. right now yeah. when you had KD and Kyrie alongside. Right. None of those guys are going to be the vocal leaders that were going to pull everybody in the same direction. Harden has been like the poster boy of this throughout his entire career with the exception of probably the best teams that he was on in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, City at the very beginning of his career. Yeah. And well, and Philly went super great too, didn't it? He, <laughs> Philly was awful. But yeah, and so it's it, it's part of this. Their problem is the roster makeup, and they just went about it. It's almost like they went Trader Bob and just tried to find a bunch of awesome pieces to put together and be like, oh, we'll figure it out. Yeah, talent is there in spades, yes. and they are a good enough team to win a championship. And we we talk about this all the time, but. The reverence that players speak of Paul George mm-hmm. being like their favorite, the young guys in the league are like, my favorite player is Paul George. Yeah. Because he's, from a basketball perspective, what he can do on the floor, very few people can accomplish. But is he a leader? That's it. Yeah. See, and he's and not. That- that that's kind of I feel like the problem we saw this with Phoenix. We're looking at the three guys that are leading the team, making fifty plus million dollars. Not one of them is a leader on or off the court. They're right. just a scorer. So. I mean, I, I'm all about guys getting their bag, but it does kind of make me wonder, are teams getting what they actually want out of that $50 million salary? I think it's too much. I don't think guys are worth that. But if they're getting that, they've got to be getting leadership, scoring, and, and just all the intangibles. I feel like that's what a $50 million like top-of-the-league salary should entail you as a player. That's what you're getting as a team. But that that is not what these guys are paying for. And it just makes me wonder... Is this going to be happening much longer? It will because God. you're you're worth whatever a team's going to pay, right? But and I'm, with it, the salary cap structured the way that it is, and these guys all hit their benchmarks, right? Being all NBA, being an all star that qualify you for super max deals. All these guys hit it because yeah. of the talent. And when you hit those benchmarks, you're going to get that money. But I, I think what you're saying, Schultz, is. When are teams going to wisen up and say, I don't, uh, th- this guy is not worth that freight because does he get us to a championship? If you have a the alpha leader, yes, yeah. 100% you can be. You you pay those guys because those are the guys that get you ranks. Yeah, and there aren't a ton of those right now. No, Dame, no. Giannis. I, I mean, if two are on the same team. I think Joel know? Embiid is one of those guys too. Agreed. But at what point do we just go, we just don't trust the Clippers? <laughs> Like, yeah. There's some teams that it's like it doesn't matter who's on that roster. Yeah. It isn't gonna be they're the, gonna screw it up. The team that gets over the hump. Yeah. And it's you could just it, it doesn't have to be the leadership vacuum that that you have here, where they're just they have none. Mm-hmm. It do, it doesn't have to be they had leadership, they had great players, but Chris Paul would get hurt, Blake Griffin would get hurt, DeAndre Jordan would get hurt. Like it it's always something yes. with the Clippers where you're just like there's some franchises that just when it comes playoff time, they don't have that it. Yeah. Right. Well, sometimes it's like with the Clippers in the past during the Griffin and the CP3 area, it's like they were snake bitten. But now it's just like they can't they just can't put it together. And that is always it's always fascinating to me because you have the there's a certain number of franchises. It's a very small percentage of teams where you go, I just don't trust them in the playoffs. The Clippers are one of they may be number one mm-hmm. because we have bad franchises. Bad franchises are a joke, and we laugh at them all the time, right? right? Where you're like, they're not even going to make the playoffs. And, and, and they're just a joke. Yeah. Pirates, A's. Yep. Rockies. Rockies. I mean, the Hornets right now, mm-hmm. right? You sit there and you look at these teams, you're just like, you're not even close. What are you talking about? Yeah. But it's another level to be like what the Clippers are, which is really damn good. But once they get to the playoffs, you're like, you have no shot in hell. Yeah, which is why I'm always baffled so many preseasons and leading into the seasons, how many talking heads and pundits you have that are, you know, putting the Clippers in their top three, four favorites to win a title. I'm like, what? Why? Why do you, Why do they deserve this recognition? Why do they deserve those kinds of expectations? <laughs> because if they can put it together, yeah. right? We always, in one hand and do what in the other? We get that. I mean, and look, when we're talking about this, though, Teams that can be very good, can be a top four seed, can be, hell, a three seed. Mm -hmm. But you know they're just not going to win the playoffs. That was 
that was the Portland Trailblazers. And for quite some time. For a very long time. Yes. And they kind of fit that mold, too, where you're just sitting there. But here's the difference with the Clippers, that nobody was talking about the Blazers winning a championship. Right. right? Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Clippers have been in this. They could win a championship, and where they're very good— I mean, they are really damn good. When they are bad, they are dreadful. They, to me, they're kind of like, and we don't we don't talk about them enough because there's always so much turnover in the NFL. It's kind of like the Houston Texans. When the Houston Texans, and maybe they may be changing their lot in life because mm-hmm. they got C.J. Stroud and they got Will Anderson and they seem to be trending in the right direction with D'Amico Ryans. But really, since their existence, they've either been god-awful yeah. or they have been really good, but you just go, uh, they're not going to win they're not going to win a playoff game, right? Let alone two. Yeah, and they've never been to a conference championship game, but they've only been around since two thousand one, exactly. right? And a lot of that in that regard too is you got to, whether it's basketball or baseball or or football, when you're a young team like that, you got to start out taking your lumps first. What? Okay, five zero three eight six four six three two six. That is the Vancouver Ford text line. What are the team franchises? You can go across sports, and this isn't just like bad bad franchise. Poor ownership, poor direction, yeah. void of talent. These are good teams. That they always trust. talk about being a, a contender, but can never get over that hump. 